Welcome to the Intern Whisper, the show all about the future of work and innovation. Today's Intern Whispers tip of the week for employers. Remember to put your interns in date on your calendar so you can wrap up the projects one to two weeks out before they leave. You want to make sure that timing is spot on. That way you can be sure to tell them thank you and for all of the great work they did and acknowledge them. So today's guest is Rosangelo Parker, one of my friends from City District of Orlando and also an intern pursuit employer. So welcome Rosangela to my podcast. I'm so excited. Thank you. Thank you so much, <laughs> Isabella. I love to be here. Awesome. I am very happy to have you here. So the first part of our show, we're going to talk about education, innovation, and the future of jobs and industries in the second part. And I'm going to let Axel kick us off with the, the actual question. Go ahead, Axel. Okay. So the first question is, please share with our viewers your educational background and work history. Absolutely. I am a graduate of Seminole State College Go here State. in Seminole, uh, here in Seminole County in Central Florida. I pursued a career in business and information management. After, while I was there, just to help support the issue here a little bit more, I actually started working with the county of Seminole uh, as an intern. So while I was in college pursuing my degree, I had applied for an internship with Seminole County government where I started in economic development. That role eventually led to me securing a full-time employment through their tourism office. And uh, that was my career for 10 years, working in travel tourism for Seminole County and Orlando and North Seminole County Tourism. Did you get to do any great trips since you were in tourism? Absolutely. It's always fun to work in travel and tourism. Hospitality industry is wonderful. Uh, I was able to coordinate different um, familiarization tours. That's uh, lingo for uh, bringing uh, tourism industry partners together and showcasing what a destination has to offer. And so I was able to co coordinate those. I brought media and travel writers, uh, bloggers to experience uh, our, our downtowns, our nightlife, our, our nature scene, whatever was available. So it was always fun. It's a lot of work and people think that, oh, you're just out there having fun. And it is fun, but it is a lot of work to coordinate. And, um, but it was a great experience and I really enjoyed it. So my time during the last 10 years was focusing on economic development, on marketing and travel and tourism. So you're like, I don't know, 26, I'm gonna guess right now because you're like <laughs> fresh out of school and everything. <laughs> no, I wish I could say that. That was, a, I was a, a, re, a returning student to college when I went wow. and pursued that degree. Prior to that, I was pursuing a degree in science and I really enjoy sciences, but you know, mm -hmm. business is everywhere. So I kind of decided that to go true. that path. Business is in church, it's in nonprofits, it's also in the government. Everything is business. It is not just for profit. People mm -hmm. don't remember that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I'm going to skip to the next question. What is the mission of City District? Where the do you mission, work now? Yes. So City District is all about our business community. We are here to support industry and um, really coordinate between the business community, our visitors, and serve as a liaison with the City of Orlando. Our cool. mission is really to bring people together, really uh, providing a better business environment, being good neighbors and strengthening our community at large. Very nice. So go back to our other question before this one, Axel. How did you get involved with the community of Orlando? Um, good question. Uh, I actually was working with um, Seminole County Tourism's office and had reached out uh, regarding an event that was happening in Orlando. I thought it was so fantastic. I wanted to bring it, that experience also to our destination. And through those relationships, um, who knew that Sometime later, those relationships would then develop into a career change, a career opportunity, uh, where I was later recruited by individuals in Orlando to come down to downtown Orlando and, um, and lead city district, which was formerly the Church Street District, into what would be an expansion. They really uh, felt that I had the skills in all three areas of interest, which was, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our tourism, economic development and marketing. 
All right, so what services does City District offer? Because I don't think that people know that City District is a part of something called Main Street. And I think that there's two sides to that story that we should probably tell. Yes, so we are a nationally accredited Main Street through Main Street America. That's a four point approach. It's focused on promotion, economic development, design, as well as organization. It's meant to help increase the vitality of our business community. And so we work directly with our merchants within our district, providing them opportunities to elevate their experience. We help program events to help attract visitors um, and potential customers to their businesses. So it's, it's a combined effort. The primary goal is really to help the economic vitality of the community, as well as doing some historic preservation and preserving the history and culture of an area and promoting those things, bringing in new audiences from around, so. Yeah, so my understanding in like really simpler terms is it's about making sure that there's lots of money coming to that area. Yeah. People are spending money there and they are enjoying a lot of the services that are available, whether it's retail, maybe it's entertainment. Mm -hmm. We in the downtown area are known for having a very, I would say vibrant nightlife, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, but it's usually for a specific demographic. <laughs> you and I were talking one time about having more retail in the downtown area and how we could see it to provide, be able to provide more. Absolutely. To people because I'm not a I'm not a person that goes to the bars in the evening. Yeah. So I would enjoy we do have one movie theater, but like what if we got the old Beecham back and was showing black and white cinematic old school movies? That That's would be absolutely vintage. fantastic. Absolutely right? fantastic. Unfortunately, the Beecham has removed all of their theater seating. Oh, it's an sad. open space. And so um, it would take a huge investment to try to retrofit the space into that, what, what it was before, which was yeah. a theater, but that would be absolutely beautiful. Mm. Um, to your point, yeah, there is there is a need to diversify our offerings in downtown, and that's something that as a district we are looking at and we did a community survey, which gave us a lot of insights into how the community um, would like to experience downtown and what their current uh, feelings are of what our downtown experience has to offer. And retail was one of the big ones. And so we know that retail is important. We would love to see it in the district. And so we're taking baby steps. We currently started, we recently started with uh, offering markets. So we're putting Sunday fun day markets in the district to engage visitors with retail opportunities and bring visitors, um, vendors to the area to experience downtown. We're hoping that this will then help us lead to step two, which would be an actual brick and mortar marketplace. And that would ultimately allow us to allow businesses to experience the downtown in a, in a retail setting, but more in a business incubator type of space. Mm. where they can develop their following, develop their customer base, and hopefully outgrow that space and need their own storefront. And then you we can help what? move them to that next level, which would be three, filling in some of those vacancies with retail offerings. I am thinking of, I remember the building that Starter Studio is in, it's called the Exchange Building. And it was where there were shops, there were retail shops, there were game arcades, there was all types of places to eat. And it was truly, you know, to me, magical because I was a young kid at that time. Anyway, now that I'm looking back at it and went, it needs to be in a building kind of like this, mm -hmm. where it would be brought back into, okay, you can go shopping for, there's only one place to go and get women's clothing and it's down on Central, down by Lake Eola. Like that is it. I don't know of anywhere else other than the uh, Walgreens that's on the corner where I could go buy flip-flops. <laughs> you know, so that that yeah. offering is desperately needed. I can, you know, definitely speak to that. Going back to what you were sharing though, you mentioned that they were Friday fun days. Where Sunday, Sunday, Sunday fun, fun days. days. Yes. So I will come to that. Where yes. are those pop up? Are they pop ups? They are. Right now, we're looking to secure second Sundays of every month at the Wall Street Plaza, which is more centrally okay. located in our central business district. And um, we did the, we did a themed one for superheroes uh, back in 
May and it was it was very well received. We got positive feedback from the community, positive feedback from our vendors, and I just thought it was just a prime opportunity. So um, we worked with a, an event organizer with Pink Fink Productions for that one, and they've asked to become a permanent staple here in our downtown. So we're working on that. We're hoping that that will lead us to attracting additional retail locations in downtown Orlando. That would be district. awesome. Yeah, I yeah. could see something like that really bringing so much value to the people that live downtown. Now, I don't live in any of the apartment communities that are around here, but I'm only six miles away. And if I knew that was available, that would be so great to go to because a lot of the places that I have gone, whether it was, I think it's Steinmart that closed their doors, it was one of them. Mm -hmm. And I was so, super sad when they closed because there's not a lot of ability to go. And I like to touch mm -hmm. fabric and touch the products. So I'm more tactile. I agree. There are a lot of us who enjoy the shopping experience. Yes. It's retail therapy. Yes, it is retail therapy. And for all you retail therapy hungry people, we are working on it downtown Orlando. Yeah. That is yeah. so good to hear. So good. <laughs> So anyway, we're coming back to what the original question was. You answered on the services, I think it was. Um, how does somebody actually participate with Orlando City District? It's a membership-based? So there's, there's two ways. We have uh, our board is 100% volunteer-based. Our committees are volunteer-based. So if you're looking to participate and being a part of the change that we experience here in downtown Orlando, we invite you to reach out and, um, and become a volunteer. If you are looking to participate from a business perspective, we have our brick and mortar businesses in downtown. It is membership based and we help provide services to our business community through those membership dollars. Those membership dollars also help us program special events to attract additional traffic into downtown. And so those are ways to engage. And then those who are from outside of the district and just wanna get involved and maybe have their own uh, business and want to participate as a vendor for an upcoming event, they can reach out as well. And, and we keep an active list. So whenever events uh, are occurring in downtown, we reach out. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. All right. I'm going back to you, Axel. The hardest part of your role with City District of Orlando? Right now, it's, it's um, rebuilding, uh, redefining our downtown recovery uh, post-COVID. That is always a challenge when you've seen so many businesses be impacted so heavily. And so the financial hardship that many have felt is something that we are working together as a community to help each business out and, and hopefully try to retain as many businesses as po possible. That, that is definitely a big part. So when you talk about what's the hardest part, is being that shoulder for everyone during these moments of hardship and, and still being um, having the strength to keep pushing, not only for them, for yourself, but not burning yourself mm -hmm. out. Because a lot of this, if you know, for myself personally, I can say I get emotionally attached mm -hmm. to the people and the businesses in our community. And so when I see them going through difficult times, it's, it's a difficult time for us both. And so I really enjoy working with our business community. Um, I think many of them have been so resilient and so strong and continue to push forward. So for me, that's been the toughest challenge. And, um, you know, right now with the pandemic, fundraising has been a big challenge. Obviously, uh, our three sources of revenue start with membership. We stop charging our membership dues, uh, which are collected monthly in order to help our businesses during this tough economic uncertain period of uncertainty. And then also the events, all the events were shut down. And so we would use events through sponsorship and ticket sales and such to generate revenue. And so that came to a complete halt. So we're, we're looking to um, restart and um, hoping for the best, but we are, we're definitely um, confident that we will come out of this pandemic bigger, better, and stronger than ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would have to, because so many businesses uh, that were online were doing, you know, probably very well or relatively well, because you don't have to worry about that supply chain or any type of inventory that's on the shelf. One of the things that I have noticed is that um, this was actually on the news and it leads into some of what we're talking about a little bit further, but the restaurants are actually feeling the pain of that supply chain and getting food in there and then also getting people to come back in and to work. So that's been the biggest 
problem. I think that then you have the added, I guess I would say issue of people that would deliver the food to those people who go, oh, I don't want to come out and you know pick up food. I think at this point in time, most people are out and about. So I feel like they should go and support the restaurants. And at the same hand, I'm going, I, I don't know what we could possibly do to help with the supply chain. Yes, I, I would say I definitely agree with all three of those, but the one that right now is most greatly impacting our business community is the workforce. Yes. Um, the lack of uh, employees or applicants at this point. And, you know, we are working with our businesses in City District, providing resources, not only for the businesses, but also for those employees that have been here through it all providing them financial resources to help yeah. with, uh, you know, if they have the rent that's past due, if there is, uh, if they have any bills that are, that are causing any financial hardship for our employees, mm -hmm. um, as a community, we're coming together to help our businesses and, and we're all in this together. So it's not just our, our business owners and our managers, but it is everyone from our dishwashers to our servers you name it, um, we've, we have resources available to help them during these difficult times as well. Yeah, that is a, a really big, I think, struggle that the restaurants are feeling. And certainly it impacts the bars, I think, too, because still there's a supply chain with whether it's beer, wine, alcohol that they're selling. So yeah, and chicken wings. There's and chicken shortage wings. of chicken wings right now across <laughs> the nation. And so here you are having to make up a decision. Do you pay extra for chicken wings or do you find something else on the menu? Yeah, plant-based foods now. <laughs> yeah, but there you go. Yep, yep. Uh, so we've been talking about how COVID has affected the businesses during the, uh, during the pandemic. Um, and even when it first happened way back in March of last year, what do you think was going on in the minds? Are people, for me, I think they were going, is this real? I don't know, what, how is this impacting? And everybody was scurrying around mm -hmm. from the city uh, mayors, and we have we have two mayors, right? A we county have city mayor, and a county, yeah. yeah. So I I should know this, but you know I'm just still double checking. And so it's getting all of those people to start talking to each other about how this was going to be handled. Oh, it comes all the way from the top, from the federal government to our state leaders to our regional and local leaders. So yeah. It was definitely challenging because there were the ideally you'd have the same message coming from all, but that wasn't necessarily the case. So there was a lot of uncertainty and confusion. Is it this? Is it not this? Should we be doing this? Should we not be doing this? And so uh, there was a lot of uncertainty, but things things are things are getting better now. Things sorted are, out. Sorted yeah. out. Yeah. So how is this coming across with the events? Now we're here, mm -hmm. and I've seen a couple events over here on Church Street. Yeah. And there was, uh, I guess, uh, a soccer game that's going on. So There's a soccer game. People this are evening. coming now. People are coming out. Yes, absolutely. So that has been very exciting to see that we're finally able to um, start inviting people into downtown, into the businesses. Again, the workforce uh, shortage is causing the delays in you know, your service. So please be patient with our restaurant bar service. If you come in and it's taking a little bit longer for your order, um, you have a, a limited staff that's trying to provide you the best experience possible. Uh, but yes, we are, um, we are planning events and they are picking up. They really are. We have more events coming this fall and um, we, we continue to invite people to come downtown to support the business community because at the end of the day, they're the ones who help support uh, additional workforce and they also help provide that downtown experience that we've all grown to love. Mm, that is true. So is there going to be anything for Halloween? Oh, how dare you ask? Yes. <laughs> On something and I cannot disclose. Okay, um, but surprises um, are good. But we're, we're working on a very fun um, event for Halloween and uh, we're, we're just going to ask that you please stay tuned. Okay, well, I'm going to throw a couple things because we are in Orlando, just so our listeners know. One of the things that we have, two things that I think are pretty unique, is there is this uh, cemetery, Greenwood Cemetery, and they do Halloween walks through the cemetery. And I, I did that. And when I did, I don't, they said it wasn't planned, but I, I don't know if it was or is, was not. At the end of the tour, we came in and we heard this 
cat screech super loud. <laughs> it was like, oh my God, what was that? And she goes, that was not planned. I don't know what this is, but I, let me go and check what this is. And I went, okay, either she's a really good actress or maybe that was real. You know, I'm not sure. But that was one of the things, uh, uh, like a, a tour of the Greenwood Cemetery. And there's a lot of really famous people down there in that cemetery. That was surprising to me. Hey, there are a lot of interesting stories here in the heart of downtown. Take one of our uh, ghost adventure tours. I was going to say that one is the second yes. one. Yes. Yeah, so there's some interesting stories about some of the buildings in downtown. So I think I've never heard of these bubbles. Yeah. Okay, well now you know. Yeah, well, now you I have, know. <laughs> you have to come and experience them. And there's there there are different tours that are scheduled. Um, and you can just reach out and, and schedule one of the tours um, and experience downtown now, from a different point of view. The one for the Greenwood Cemetery, you have to book that in advance and it was free, I believe. I believe it was free. I don't know if it still is. But the the haunted tours, the walking tours, those they charge for, I believe. There right? is there is a fee because you do have uh, a guided someone, tour. You have a it is a guided tour, and sometimes they include drinks at different bars and experiences. So it depends the tour that you book. It's a it's a fun way to get together with friends and experience downtown, um, and learn something about the history and the culture and some of the hauntings. Yeah, and that's a real human. <laughs> that's taking them that is a real human you may have a couple ghosts accompanying you but i cannot guarantee that yeah yeah yeah. so that's a kind of a fun thing and then i'll throw something else out here we're trying to get sax comedy club as comedy club as a guest on the podcast too because it's really nice to be able to go out and just laugh it is fantastic if there's anything therapeutic it's laughter remember Mm -hmm. that and Sax Comedy Club, I attended one of their um, shows. I did too. It was great. It was fantastic. The improv was hysterical. I, I really enjoyed it. So enjoyed an evening on ta- in the town, got some dinner and watched a show and just, you know, and mm-hmm. then got my cardio workout, you know. So uh, Axel went there. I told him that was one of his requirements for yes. the internship is to go there. So Axel, why don't you share what it is that <laughs> you did in that session with Sax? So... What I did over there was pretty much so I wasn't the only one. There was like a lot of people that were like kind of heat split. So, but what we did was like pretty much since like it was like our first time, we did like a couple exercises and just like being like very comfortable of of what we were doing. So like let's say, and we were playing a lot of games. We were playing a couple games just so that we like can be going slow and then slowly building up, like going faster, because that's, that's how acting can be. Like, okay, but of slow, but there's certain scenes that you do that you're gonna be do like a lot more faster than you would on a regular scene or go really slow, then build up really fast. So there was a couple of exercises that we did that was really fun. And then at the end, we were playing, we all got together. So we got separated into two groups. So that we like can know each, each other's names was the first thing. We would start off from, let's say, Isabella Johnston, and then we would have to say like a, what her personality was. And then we would go from there all the way to the end. And everybody started from the very beginning, all the way around, had to memorize everybody's name. So that, was, that was the first task, was memorizing everybody's name. And then the second part was pretty much saying, uh, like different words, but like it had some sort of similarity. So it was like zip, zap, zo. And you would say it slow and then say it really fast. And then you would point to the direction of whichever actor you pointed out. So you would go zip, the other person would go zap to the other person and you would do it uh, faster until someone will mess up and then you have to start all over. Hmm. And then you would also, there was one more activity that we did where you would do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And on the seventh, and it would be like on the shoulder tap, on the shoulder tap. And then on the seven, you would have to do like some something like this. And then you you could either go back or go forward to the other person. So it was very cool. Some of it was fast paced. And I learned a lot from it. And at the very end, we all got together and we all got on stage. So we did three rounds of like naming whatever categories. So let's say like movies or like, let's say specific horror, horror movies. 
And if it takes you more than two seconds to say it, then you are eliminated or people will just shout out die. <laughs> no, that was no pressure. No pressure. But yeah, um, it was it was a lot of fun. I was surprised how long I lasted. To be honest, I thought I was gonna be a little frisky out, but I did pretty well. I was like probably the top four, top five. Okay, so, so I want to try this right now. So Axel, horror movie, quick. Child's play. What? Child's play. What was it? Child's play. Oh, child's play. But sorry. The Conjuring. The Ring. Uh, I'm you're out. Out. Yeah, you're out. Yeah, I actually had <laughs> one before I did that. And then I went, oh, I forgot my movie. That's but how that works. Say, um, say, no, I was going to say Salem's Lot. Uh, I'm not a fan of horror movies, but I, I know. I'm not either. Me either. I'm not a fan of it. I either. saw a lot of Stephen King movies, and mm -hmm. then one of them was Salem's Lot, and that went, okay, I will never watch another movie because that was way too real for me. Oh, Vampire gosh. movies. Yeah. Not a fan. Not a fan. Well, that was fun. So, uh, <laughs> that, yeah, and I Thanks got eliminated. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, that is so sad. But I am going to throw another thing out here that's, I think, pretty cool that we have downtown. Well, two things. Downtown at the lake, we have uh, Lake Eola Amphitheater. Mm -hmm. And so we always will have either some type of movie down there. And we'll also have Shakespeare in the Park, I think. Yeah. There's, Shakespeare there's in the Park. Different. Yeah, Shakespeare. Yeah, it's the, there's a, a variety of different programming that happens at the um, at the shell over at Lake Eola, and that's part of the Thornton Park District, one of our sister main streets. Mm, that's pretty cool. And then we also have a history museum here. We do. We in a the, really cool building. It's fantastic. Uh, if you've not experienced it, they have different exhibitions and they have some that change and then they have some really cool events like game nights uh retro game nights and so those are always fun to attend and um, do they do them with parties i mean like you know can you take your whole company down there you know that's a very good question and i don't know but i will have to find out but i do mm. know that they have scheduled game nights i, I would imagine they probably do accept group um reservations. Do you have to be a member to participate or is it open to the public to join it know? is open to the public you don't have to be a member there is a cost to participate oh i yeah. would think so yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that sounds fun so yeah. i i would like to see some of those things promoted for sure because those the things that we're talking about that is exactly what i would go and do it anything so that's fun. like those oh for sure yeah. if Absolutely. there's a walking tour one of the things that we did with my previous interns that were with me uh, last year in fall, it was fall, we did a walking tour of Orlando and we identified the buildings with the historic markers on them. Mm -hmm. And we had, I think it was about 30, 30 something uh, historic sites. And so we set it up as a virtual scavenger hunt and whoever <laughs> put a picture of the plaque and then we would say, okay, so what address is this located on? or we would put an address and we would ask them, what is the historic marker that goes with this address? So we wanted to see, we could, they could people could either do it on the ground and walk, mm -hmm. and it took an hour, honest to goodness, and it was great. And it was during you know that time of COVID, people are still mm -hmm. going, okay, we need to get out. So it was a way to get outside, be mm -hmm. in fresh air. They could also do it virtually, and there were prizes if they did it, and they got t-shirts, so. Yeah, you know, well, and fun. candy. It was Halloween, so nice. Yeah. Okay. But it yeah. I don't know if you guys have anything like that as a yeah. Activity. There are there are some historic guide historic self guided as well as during the fall. I think that you actually have a guided uh, tour, historic tour. So there are uh, art walks that's self guided. There's a map for that. Mm -hmm. There's a map for historic buildings uh, where it's self guided. And I believe it starts back up in the fall where it is guided by the historian for the city of Orlando, provides a lot of history information. If, if you're into architecture, they talk about the, the all the details of the architecture. It's quite mm. fascinating. Um, so yeah, there are quite a few uh, self guided, but as far as guided, we have two, um, if not three companies that offer guided tours in downtown and well, we talked about the ghost tours and mm -hmm. that's always fun. 
Uh, and around Orlando also does tours. Some of them are foodie tours. Some of them are libation tours. So if you're looking for that special cocktail, um, that might be something if you're not sure where to go and what to try, maybe just experience it through a tour and get familiar with a couple of different locations and then you'll know where to invite your friends next time you're downtown. Mm -hmm. I know that Starter Studio used to be a part of a Thursday event and it was a Thursday art hop, I think is what it was. Mm. And we, we used to have a lot of different artists that would come and display their art here. Every month it would be a rotating art exhibit and it truly was an art hop. And we could go to different buildings throughout downtown Orlando and see artists work. I don't know if that is actively still going on, but I don't that would believe be it fun. is, but that would be fun. So I think that's something that I just need to add on our list. That would mm -hmm. be a fun thing to do. And then well. I'll give you one more. So something else that we did, I can't remember the name of what the organization is that does it, but it's a pop-up and it would be concerts. And so one time we had a pop-up right here in our community area we cleared the tables out and then they came in this group came in and they put like you know pillows on the floor like sitting pillows mm. and they had in the corner the um it was a three-piece uh band and so they put on this little concert and we had probably a, like a hundred people in here they came in with all of the libations as you mentioned uh regular beverages because there was also kid friendly mm -hmm. But it was really cool and pop up little concerts. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys do that, but we do our, our share of different types of concerts right now. We're, we're looking to see what we're going to start programming for mm -hmm. this fall and into 2022. Um, it's always fun. Music is always a great way also as a stress reliever and mm -hmm. something to enjoy. So just like laughter, music is fantastic. And so anything we can do to bring uh, live music into our district is always something that's of interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I'll throw one more thing out here. So I did not know that Lake Eola was not part of city district. Yeah. You said Thornton Park. Yes. That's interesting. So down there at Lake Eola, they have yoga in the park mm -hmm. on Sundays. Is there anything that's within the district that you guys also promote? Where so if you're looking for yoga, like there are yoga. actually, there are some really interesting offerings. Um, there is uh, one of our locations in downtown offers a rooftop yoga. Oh. Um, we have yoga at City Arts. So if you enjoy arts, um, they do yoga regularly in the evenings there. Um, nice. So that's an option. If you haven't been to the lawn, the front yard at um, the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center, they've been offering yoga and Zumba and another type of fitness class Saturday mornings. And so, yeah, there's different offerings. We were looking to put some activity like that on Turf Street. And when we went digging, we found there was already some others existing. So we're just supporting what's here and, and oh, really that promoting our great. businesses. Yeah. So I'm really hoping that what our listeners here that are certainly our local listeners is that there is so much more to Orlando than what we thought. There are obviously exercise and fitness things that they can take advantage of. The lake itself, they can walk around. It's almost a mile, I think, all the way around. There's places that you can go and play with your dogs, your pets, and we haven't even touched on that. But then there's things like the museums that we have and the, the history, the, the culture. History. Yeah. Yeah. There is so much here to Orlando. So don't feel like Orlando is maybe just either bars or in this case, you know, places to eat. It is definitely more than that. Absolutely. So we're going to take a little break and acknowledge our sponsor, Cat5 Studios. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios, who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. So here we are back to our show, and it's all about internships and sharing what the future of work looks like in 2030. Axel, you did some research. You went to clickorlando.com. That's super cool. Oh. And you were looking at the growth predictions and there's seven of them. Is this right? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Don't say yes, ma'am to me ever again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The first thing that's going on in Orlando is to build out and speed up regional transit systems. How many times are you driving on these roadways here that we see construction everywhere around us, right? 
I see it once in a while. When I was in college, I saw it a lot more. <laughs> this consistent construction everywhere, especially in I-4. Even a couple of years ago, when I was still in high school, I would see like construction everywhere. And I'm not just talking about railroads. We're talking about like buildings as well. There's always like... But we're sticking to transit systems though. Okay. We're gonna oh, yeah, that. I would always see... Yeah, we're going to talk about buildings, but definitely transit systems. That includes like what? Uber, Lyft, Uber, Lyft, bikes, trains, scooters, trains. I'm pretty sure there's buses. There's there, there's gonna be more. Uh, I think railroad tracks since Orlando is. I think it's supposed to go north and south up the state. Is Was it okay? Happen? Yeah, because they've already their plans are to build out the SunRail all the way from east coast to west coast. There is a plan for that. But they also want to make a, uh, there's been a lot of discussion within the state of Florida to build out a train, a bullet train that would take us from here to Miami in like an hour. And that's really very, very speedy. And that's why they're calling it a bullet train. This build out and speeding up the regional transit system is a big increase to be able to help provide more jobs to us in this area, you know, help build up more education. Uh, we would be increasing educational opportunities, healthcare, attractions, services, everything that's in there, that's all part of the economic development plan for a state, for a city, and part of what is a, uh, a lot of what Rose Angela was talking about as it relates to the growth. Economic development is all about growth and how that impacts every aspect of our life all the way across from transportation, as I mentioned, education, healthcare, jobs. Those are big, big ways that we can actually see that we have people thriving here in Orlando and businesses thriving. What about all of this stuff that's going on with I-4? The ultimate I-4 project, I believe it was slated, and maybe you can double check, look it up real quick. How long was this supposed to be? Uh, Google ultimate I-4 project, because it's been, I think, three years we've been doing this. I'm going to say three years. I think it's been longer. I'm not sure. I believe it was supposed to be a, I, I don't even want to say, because I'm going to be sure I'm wrong a very time consuming project to build I out I4 all the way from Disney to Seminole County that's a big stretch of land to make it accessible to five lanes on each side all going east one going west do you see it yet what was the I'm looking at uh um I just don't see like the year. yeah I'm anyway looking at at a website now. All right. While you're doing that, it was the ultimate I-4 project was there to add more capacity, to be able to provide more, again, more jobs, to drive more traffic to the main downtown corridor of downtown Orlando, and to achieve a lot more ability for transportation to flow more smoothly east and west across, for the most part, our state. That's okay if you don't find it. We're going to look at the east-west connection and where east-west is supposed to be focusing on is the key locations throughout central florida that were supporting any type of commuter traffic visitors to the downtown area the supply chain needs and providing more integration with a lot more diversity to businesses that were here i think that's significant we wanted to be able to, the fourth one, I believe, the fourth principle, or not principle, but the fourth uh, priority for the Central Florida area is to strengthen Central Florida's global gateways. Now, you had mentioned air flight airplanes being able to travel in and out of Orlando. We know that we have the really great Orlando airport that is international. But I think a lot of people don't know that there is one in, in Seminole County, and it's at the Sanford, in, located in Sanford, and it also is an international airport. Sometimes I didn't even know that. Yeah, it's a really nice one because honestly, if you go to that airport, it's not quite as busy as the Orlando one, and you can sometimes get lower flights. I mean, lower priced flights, not lower flights, but lower priced flights. 
And that means that you might be more inclined to travel. Now it's a little bit further down the road, depending on where you leave. But even some people from Tampa, when they're looking for international flights, they will drive from Tampa to Orlando or even sometimes to Sanford to be able to pick a flight that is more that accommodates their time of day they want to leave or come back, being able to go to a location that they might not have been able to get to with a different airline. For example, maybe it's Southeast. So there's different reasons why people choose those. But again, we're focusing on the global gateways, and that is truly the international airports. They're also talking about space, and we're fortunate enough in Central Florida to have be right around the corner from NASA. Um, the sea, the rails, and obviously the highways, those are all big ways that people come in and out of the city. And we want to be able to have people come to the downtown area to support our, not just in this case, our restaurants and some of the entertainment that we have, but be able to actually engage with other things about Orlando that make it really great. We have this really pretty park, like we had talked about earlier with Rosangela, Lake Eola. We have the History Museum. There's also a theater that's right down here in the heart of downtown Orlando that is an amazing theater, one of those with reclining seats and all kinds of fancy stuff that you can do. Yeah, that, and then we also have the um, escape room as well. Where's, I think the escape room is down, on International Drive, right? There's there's one here in downtown. Where? I don't know where exactly, but I know what's around here somewhere. The fifth <laughs> area of growth that we will be talking about in downtown Orlando is taking the lead in transportation innovation, which includes having more automated, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. I was just talking with Steve today, this morning, and Steve Miner with the Orlando World Life Foundation. We were discussing how there's going to be this influx of cars that autonomous driving cars, right? Self-driving cars. And he was speaking with somebody last week about that. And there is a lot of that coming into the downtown area. Uh, to empower the Regional Transportation Authority to oversee expansion and management and the operations of all of this public transit systems. It's just sounding like this is a, a big ordeal to be, I don't know if I should say ordeal. It's going to be a big deal to <clears throat> actually have the ability to have a transit system that supports the city it doesn't take away, it moves people in and out very easily. And to invest boldly in sharing a regional vision for transportation to support communities and global competitive economy. The biggest takeaway about all of this, I think, is the fact that for years we've been living with the I-4, uh, ultimate I-4. I'm going to Google it while we're also talking. It's 2021. Okay, so when is when did it start though? Oh, darn. I didn't get that. Um, I, I think it was... I'm well, Googling I'm, it right now. Um, it says it's in, your question I can read it to you. April, it's in Magnolia. Let me read it. Uh, it says it was started in 2015, early 2015, and it's widening the road will take place. It's a 21 mile stretch. And how far, how long is it supposed to take place? You said? All of 2021, which is this year. There's a post. You're saying it's supposed to be done this year? By this fall. Hmm. It's six years. That's link. And it says the construction will continue years beyond I-4 Ultimate Project. It's also, <clears throat> excuse me, it started in 2015. And as I'm scrolling through this whole article, I'm doing it super fast. It costs $4.5 billion. And construction could extend another 10 to 15 years beyond the current project, <laughs> that it would be a 60-mile stretch on I-4. That is serious stuff here. I'm still looking for that last, uh, when they're saying it's actually supposed to finish. I can't find it in here, sadly. I'm going to... Uh, it says fall of 2021, but what you just said, it might even be longer than that, way longer than that. Yeah. We know that the phone is used as a way to always have our eyes on whatever is going on, right? I think that's really why we have the shortest attention span in the world, because everything is on demand. It's in our face. There's no reason not to look at it. And we become lazy. We don't want to read. 
back to the phone. <laughs> anyway, people can play games on the phone. They can get directions on the phone. They can call people. They can have video calls. The phone is everything. And it becomes the way that we entertain ourselves. I believe that as we're looking at how we entertain using that Orlando, uh, the city district, it's all about entertainment. We can actually watch on Facebook Live when there is an event coming on downtown, right? We and can I do that a lot during COVID. During COVID, there were no events during COVID. No, but like um, like certain things like the uh, drive drive through theater and like certain areas. Oh, yeah. I remember well, her talk, talking about that, how how they had like certain events of like a drive through theater to like watch a movie or something because they didn't really do anything. Anyway, I do believe that we will see in the future more opportunities to immerse ourselves either through virtual reality into entertainment, as well as be able to engage with things, some type of augmented entertainment, even through our phones. So we should be paying attention to that. I think that people are tired of being locked up and they want to be able to get their entertainment with live events and being around people because we are uh, tired of being in the house, right? Yeah. I think that we can safely say that there's a lot of opportunity for being able to experience how we can see what the future of entertainment could be through the lens of economic development. And it's always going to be more about virtual reality, bringing games in, bringing augmented reality in, even if it relates to the phone. Let's go ahead and jump back into our conversation here with Rosangela. So Rosangela, you guys are an interim pursuit employer, and mm -hmm. I'm so happy to have uh, you as a partner with us. And you had last semester a student that was working with you in graphic design. Yeah. And this semester you have something that was from Valencia College. Shout out to Valencia College. And then we also, this semester, you have somebody that from Rollins College working mm -hmm. with you. Absolutely. So what do you think of our, our talent that we have here in our area? I think it's fantastic. I love the enthusiasm, um, the energy coming eager to learn new things and it's, it can be intimidating sometimes stepping into a role where you're not familiar. And so it's for me, it's always fun to just introduce them to the district, provide them the resources, and really help facilitate those relationships as they're looking to um, expand their portfolio. So the projects are meant to be fun. They're meant to be a learning process. And ultimately, it's a tool that will benefit us both. You yeah. know, in this case, hopefully have the tools to build out their portfolios and we actually have tools that we can use, um, whether it's for um, membership recruitment, whether it's for our social media, our website. Yeah, it's been yeah. fun. So skill development is the key thing that interns leave with our skills and the employer ends up getting some really cool things such as either a website or it's going to be uh, what Ashley worked on was graphics for you yeah. guys. And, you know, I know that in this case, Kevin is working on something that's specific for the board. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Super cool. So let's go and move into the future. It's 2030. We're mm -hmm. nine years out. What does the future of economic development, which is really what you support, city district supports mm -hmm. economic development. What does that look like? How would it play with either AI, automations, robots? I know we were talking about this before yeah. the show started. So Let's go ahead and throw these robots out into the center. Absolutely. Robotics, I think, are definitely going to be integrated into business in many aspects. And so when you talk about the businesses that are members of the city district, a lot of restaurants and bars, you already see robotics being adopted into those environments, whether it's for wait staff, whether it's for ordering, whether it's for sanitation. There are robotics already coming into those spaces. So you never know if you're going to have a robot bringing you your next drink or your next meal to the table. Yeah. And since there is this shortage of humans, I'm sure that robot manufacturing is, you know, scaling up there Yeah, because people are going, oh, and I guess you wouldn't tip robots. That would definitely be a cost savings to everyone. Uh, let's see. So how would you, how else do you see that coming into play? I feel like that there would be more things that are automations. For example, For sure. going into events, we've got the Amway down mm -hmm. here, Exploria Stadium, all of those things. I feel like there's going to be a place where we'll either have a badge 
and it's scanning our badge to see if we really have a real ticket and it's getting matched up so that we can walk straight mm -hmm. in. There's nobody there to you know check IDs Absolutely. in that sense, or even, I don't know if we're gonna go so far as having fingerprints or eye retina scans, but there, who knows? It's already there, facial recognition software, as you mentioned, fingerprints, retina scans, they are using some of these technologies. I mean, you're seeing in grocery stores where you can literally just pack your cart and just walk out the store and it's scanning every item that's in that cart on your way mm -hmm. out and it's charging your card so you don't have to sit there and write a check or pay with cash or even you know access your venmo account it's just right there just extracting apple it from your account. Yeah, it just takes yeah. it yeah so at this point um I, I i would believe that at some point whether it's through facial recognition you just walk into the space and it just checks you off the list if you have a ticket um if you don't it may charge you on the spot, or maybe you're just asked to come back, you know, and purchase a ticket at the box office. Yeah, you can take it because everybody has a phone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes even children have phones. And I feel like there's going to be, obviously, you can buy your tickets, whether it's through Eventbrite or whatever, show that, scan, get right on in. That's easy enough to see. Yeah. The ability to just come into those spaces I'm also thinking about how that space is managed and cleaned. And so we would have robots being able oh, to course. clean it. Yeah, we're already seeing it. Uh, this COVID environment <laughs> has really put a big push on sanitation and technologies in that space. And so we're already seeing different types of um, robotics and, and um, different types of technologies being utilized for sanitize, sanitizing from hospitals to restaurants and event spaces. So, And certainly, uh, I know that I've seen other places where they have, Disney has this in Universal, <laughs> where they have a badge or mm -hmm. a wristband that you can wear. And it's just, you swipe it, you come in, mm -hmm. it charges everything from your food, where you can just go and pick it up right off of a counter. And you're really not having to deal with people as much. Absolutely. I definitely feel like we're going to see a lot more of that. I would say even within three years, I think. Well, uh, to some extent, you're seeing it already happening with just through mobile devices where you're able to, as you said, go into an event right. where you have your event pass there, you go into a restaurant, you swipe to pay, mm -hmm. um, whatever that might be, you go, you get your ticket for, you, you call an Uber or Lyft, you know, whatever that might be, um, you get on the train, you have your ticket. So you're seeing a lot more of the technology right now. Our phone seems to be our, um, our access to it is just about everything, everything right now. Yeah. And so I, it, if anything, that'll continue to be the case. I don't know if it's going to get to a point where it's even more personalized than that, but I don't right know. Now the phone is definitely the gateway to everything. Anyway, you had mentioned before the show started also that there were plans to see cars that would were they flying? Uh, well, it there's there's air taxis right now. Air it's a taxi. program that the city of Orlando is already experimenting with in Lake Nona. So air taxis, yeah. And how does that look? What does that look like? Vertical. I was just about to ask that. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I was it's like, vertical, how is that? <laughs> vertical yeah. lifting small crafts. Think of your um, your your drones on a larger scale, and so that's that's already in development through some of the amazing companies that are coming into Orlando, and so we're we're looking to see where the future leads with that. We've already been experimenting in Orlando with uh, automated vehicles. So electronic vehicles. So, well, you have, you have the electronic vehicles. So we have charger stations for everyone who's using electric vehicles um, located throughout downtown, and that'll be expanding even further. Uh, but we're looking at autonomous driving vehicles, right? And mm -hmm. we may be seeing some of that coming into our district. We know like Nona has already um, a sample shuttle running around that's hmm. not autonomous as well. So. We're going to see more of that. Technology continues to grow and evolve. And um, as long as the silicon production comes through, you know, we should be able to see more of those technologies continue to develop. Wow, that's like crazy. So any research at your end by chance, Axel? Oh, yeah. What do you think? How is Orlando expanding? Because I've heard from family members and since people are moving down here because of COVID, and all that, do you think that will be like places like New York, Chicago, will, will be that impact? And then will like even be bigger than that? Well, I can tell you the heart of Orlando here in downtown has a lot of eyes on it and there's a lot of interest. And so I do expect an influx 
of new businesses that have opted to relocate from other states into the state of Florida to consider Orlando as their new home base. Yeah, we don't um, have to have state income tax returns. Yeah. So that's a big that's plus. That's a huge plus, a big draw. And if you consider the beautiful Florida weather, that's also a big year plus. round. Year round. Yeah. And so uh, I do I do believe that we're going to see an influx of that. And you know, one of the things that is being heavily invested on as well is housing. And so um, as you can see, there is already a huge demand right now in Florida for housing. And at this point, a shortage, a part of that shortage is also, as you mentioned earlier, just the supply chains uh, unable to fulfill the, the supply in regards to like lumber and other I materials. think there's going to be more tiny homes. They're going to go and bring those big <laughs> cases of, of uh, whatever those are, container Containers, containers or modular homes. Hey, look, I think yeah. we're open to, as long as it, it can sustain, you know, hurricane force winds, we're good. Those containers apparently can because yeah. they're made out of like nothing but just steel. pure steel. You know what? I read about this and it was in the Midwest. Now I was born in Kansas, but there are bunkers that are underground and, you know, they were missiles, missile silos and they go like really, really deep down. And they have started building cities underground. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I, I was reading about it and they have shops and hospitals and everything. And it is all underground and it is, you know, fueled through a lot of solar energy. So mm. they're not depending upon anything that is electricity. That'll be so, interesting. Yeah. Apartments and you can have businesses that they're extremely well lit. So think about it. If you were to go to where in Alaska, you have six months of sunlight mm -hmm. and six months of darkness. Well, they account for that. So the fact that you're underground and you know you need things to be brightly lit so mm -hmm. people feel like there's lighting, true sunlight is there, but the elevators zip super fast. They've been wow. testing this out and it's just like amazing. All right. So what is the best mentoring advice that you want to pass on to our listeners, what would it be? Because I default to usually something like, if it's uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. Mm -hmm. I think that's really good advice. Absolutely. You know, because everything is so digital and we see stuff all the time and we're constantly thinking, oh, is that what I'm supposed to look like? Is mm -hmm. that the way I'm supposed to react? Is this the life I'm supposed to have? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, don't even let yourself make yourself feel bad. Like stay away from things that if it's making you feel bad, stay Absolutely. away. What Absolutely. about you? What advice would you share? You know, for me, it always comes back to relationships. I really think it's meeting people and developing relationships with people you like and trust. Um, they will become your mentors. Um, surround yourself by people that are smarter than you, that mm -hmm. are going to lift you, that are going to encourage you to make those bold decisions that are going to take you to where you want to be. So at the end of the day, it's really for me about relationships. Relationships are what brought me downtown and relationships are what keep me here. Very nice. So how can our listeners contact you? Where do they find City District? What's the website? Social channels? I know you mentioned that earlier. How do they reach you? Absolutely. So you can find our website. It's www.citydistrictorlando.com. If you are on our so on social media, you can find us at uh, on Instagram at City District Orlando, as well as on Facebook at City District Orlando, on Twitter at City District ORL. And we haven't experimented with the other channels, but maybe that's something that's to come later. If you want to reach out to me directly, you can reach me via email at executive director at citydistrictorlando.com or feel free to call or text 407-508-2907. And you are on LinkedIn personally. I am on LinkedIn. So people can look her up on LinkedIn. Well, anyway, I want to make sure that I am acknowledging our sponsor. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. Thank you for our production team, Axel Laponte and Elizabeth Herbert, our podcast producers. And there's Axel. I'm sure he's waving. And then we have video and audio, audio editing, Steve Neese, and our video interns, Raymond Ahmad Khan, Berkeley Walgamot, and Mitsari Rosales Vargas. And be sure to go visit us at internpursuit.tech. That is T-E-C-H as that extension there to learn how you too can get matched with an amazing intern talent. 
So thank you for supporting The Interim Whisper by subscribing to our show on Podbean or on your favorite podcast channel. So good night. And we look forward to seeing you next week with our next guest. Thank you, Rose Angela. 